All right. Hello and welcome to Speak Truth to Power, Protecting Women and Children from Policy to Enforcement. I'm Remy Lindback, Project and Graphics Manager at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. And today I'm joined by two change makers, um, Danielle Pollock and Madeline Campbell. Danielle serves as Policy Manager at the National Family Law Center, and Madeline is a freshman at Science Hill High School where she is a member of Socialize, the theater group Showstoppers, and the speech and debate team. Today, they'll discuss the work of protecting women and children in the face of domestic violence. Welcome, Danielle and Madeline. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Before we begin our conversation, for human rights issues and pursue strategic litigation to hold governments accountable at home and around the world. And Speak Truth to Power is our human rights education program that combines storytelling and interactive learning to provide the next generation with the concrete knowledge they will need to create change and advance human rights. Madeline is a part of the next generation leading the way and will lead our conversation today. So over to you, Madeline. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Danielle. And thank you to everyone that's here. <laughs> Um, if you have questions for us, just post them below and we will get back to them as we can and if we have enough time. So to start off our discussion with our first question, Danielle, for people who don't know, can you briefly summarize Caden's Law and explain what it had to you, at, had, blah, blah, explain the effect it had on you as a woman and as a parent? Sure. Thanks for the question, Madeline. Um, so Caden's Law is a, a it began as a state law um, and it became a federal law last year. Um, President Biden signed into law and it's part of the Violence Against Women Act. It's a landmark provision because it's new in the sense that it um, aims at protecting uh, domestic violence victims in family court litigation. So when parties are fighting about child custody after they separate. Um, it's very important because in the family court system, um, vulnerable victims are not being adequately protected. And so it creates um, some measures uh, for states to adopt to better protect, especially women and children um, in these child custody cases um, in a few ways. And it incentivizes states. Um, so it gives federal dollars to states to improve their custody laws. Uh, many children have been court ordered to an abusive parent um, because the courts prioritize uh, parents' rights over children's rights, um, even when they're abusive in many cases. So this law is structured to help improve that system. It's very, very meaningful to me. I've been working on this law um, for uh, about six and a half years. Um, I've worked in, in policy for, for decades, um, but I've been specifically focused on this issue of family court reform um, for the last six or seven years. And this is a really grassroots effort. It began um, from uh, becoming aware of how many gaps there are in the family court system and how many kids are getting hurt um, preventively. So it's it's very meaningful to me. I've, I've worked night and day on it for many years. So it was a, it was a big moment when we got it federally enacted and, and we were invited to the White House and um, met the president and we brought um, Caden's mom, who the law is named after. She's a little girl who was uh, murdered by her abusive father after the courts gave him uh, unsupervised parenting time and he killed her during that time. And this was despite the fact that the mom uh, was trying to raise the alarm and make the courts understand that um, Caden was in danger with her dad because he had long abusive and criminal history. Um, but the courts decided to give him uh, this access and he, he killed her. So she's one of many, many children this has happened to. We thank you for the work that you've done in our country and just helping with all of that. I'm sure it's, well, no, I know it's really important. Um, secondly, what or who called you to make this change and like inspired you to help people and work with the National Family Violence Law Center and just what inspired you to help other people? Um, 
as I said, I worked, I've worked in policy for a very long time. Um, and I had the unfortunate experience of being in the family court system um, in New York City many years ago now. And um, I was shocked, frankly, about how poorly the system protected um, victims and really did not prioritize child safety enough. I've, I felt like I'd fallen down the rabbit hole. Um, evidence was not adequately considered. Um, there were uh, junk science theories that were put forward um, and it was a very isolating experience. Uh, and so during that process, I sort of made a decision to uh, that if we got out of that system, uh, my daughter and I, that I would use my policy expertise to try to reform this system and really change the, the laws around the country um, and how these courts work. It was maybe a lofty goal <laughs> to think that we could do this, um, but I was very committed to it. And um, thankfully I've had some wonderful collaborators along the way who've helped um, shape the work that I do and, and work in, in, in close collaboration. And um, I began the process um, working in, in collaboration with a constitutional scholar um, who, her name is Marcy Hamilton. She founded Child USA and she works on statute of limitations reforms for child sex abuse survivors so that they can sue their abusers and the institutions that enable them. Um, for, and for now, there are statute of limitations which sort of limits the time um, in an arbitrary way in which um, child sex abuse survivors can, can sue the person that's harmed them or the institution that's harmed them. And so her work really focuses on reforming those laws and either abolishing the statute of limitations for these types of victims or extending the statute so they have longer time to sue. Um, and in some cases to have a look back window so that they can sue. Um, and so I learned from her um, how to um, try to create a sea change in um, an issue that's a state matter. So as statute of limitations is a state matter um, that states get to decide how those laws work, um, child custody is also a state matter. So you have to go state by state if you want to reform the laws um, around child custody. But there are a few things that you can do federally. And so this is part of why we moved, as we were working in the states to reform individual state laws, we moved uh, toward making this federal reform um, so that we could have consistency across the states in the pr more protective policy reforms that we were trying to create. And so we're sort of in that phase now of um, giving technical assistance to states to help them um, adapt these federal provisions into their state custody laws. Thank you. That was really interesting, actually, most of which I didn't know. Um, so I read a little bit about you online, and I read that you spent some time overseas in Europe. How did time in Europe affect how you approach the issues with family violence here in America and statewide? Are there any major similarities or differences between the two? Yes, um, that's a great question. And thank you for asking it because I'm not often asked that. Um, I did absolutely learn a lot about my 10 years in Italy, about policy. I was doing policy work there um, and but more importantly, I think I learned a lot about um, how the power of uh, organized citizens can really create transformation. Um, and the Italians are uh, uh, incredible organizers um, and historically and today um, around protecting um, the rights of workers and vulnerable populations. And um, they, the, the strength of collective action in Italy um, that I got to see and be part of was so powerful. Um, it's, it's a little bit different in the US. We're obviously a much larger country. Um, it's hard to create the same kind of sort of grassroots collective 
work to get policy reform and legal reform happening. Um, and because, as I said, custody law is is individual state to state, it's hard to get um, everyone moving collectively nationally in the U.S. compared to, say, um, a similar effort in Italy. And so um, also part of the work that I've done is to create sort of one umbrella network to bring together grassroots organizations from various states and locations across the U.S., to move collectively and to kind of be aligned with our policy objectives and their policy objectives and educate them, help them understand how they can take direct action in their state. And it's been really uh, miraculous. Uh, frankly, I'm, I'm amazed by the power of the grassroots um, action in individual states because people who, like me previously, who were trapped in these courts and who have their children being court ordered to be with an abusive parent in, in dangerous situations, they're, they're they're obviously deeply invested in changing the system. I mean, the power of a productive parent is is enormous, and um, so they're speaking out with their state lawmakers to help you know advance reforms. They're they're coming to testify at um, legislative hearings and tell their stories to teach um, state lawmakers really about what's happening inside these courts. The family courts are largely closed off to the public. Um, journalists can't get in there for the most part. Um, and even just people coming to the, along with uh, the parents are, are frequently turned out and um, asked to leave the courtroom. Um, and so we're really trying to kind of shed light on what's happening in these courts and how they're not adequately protecting children. And so um, I guess the, the biggest, you know, lesson I learned from living in Europe is is the importance of, of collective organizing to create social change and policy reform. Um, and, and thankfully I've been able to kind of take what I learned there in that model and apply it now to this work that we're doing. That's really, really great to hear. On a slightly more negative note, um, what were some big challenges that you faced when fighting family violence? How did you approach them, learn from them, and handle them, and take them forward with you? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it, it's a learning curve, you know, <laughs> like anything, when you're beginning sort of a new area of policy. Um, and I was thankful to have uh, Professor Joan Meyer, who is the founder and director of the National Family Violence Law Center at GW Law, where I'm the policy manager. She's worked in this area uh, for decades um, as a scholar and and, a, and a, an attorney, a litigator, and um, she's done a lot of work um, all over the country. And so uh, I was, of course, reading a lot of research to you know educate myself. I was learning from the statute of limitations reform effort and how to do this reform state by state so that we could have sort of a national sea change. And I was... Um, learning from Professor Meyer, whose research was so important in kind of um, grappling with the problems, the systemic problems in family court. And her, she published uh, the preliminary findings from her study in 2017. And that really gave me the tool that I needed to really take to lawmakers and show them what is happening inside these courts. Because of course you can't just go and, you know, tell a few anecdotal stories. I mean, it helps, but you really need the research also to show where there are system gaps and what those are. And so with her preliminary findings of this big major study that she did um, in the final study came out in 2019, but the preliminary findings were really shocking. Um, to it, it showed um, the rates by which courts were not believing um, abuse claims, particularly child sexual abuse claims, and they were, um, uh, you know, it was showing the outcomes in these cases when one party was alleging abuse and you know raising risk concerns, and the other party was cross-claiming um, using um, pseudoscience theories that are uh, pervasive in these courts that were introduced in the 1980s. Um, the name for them is uh, parental alienation, but it's nicknamed a lot of other things and been, you know, uh, uh, repackaged essentially. There's a very powerful 
um, uh, concept that's not scientifically supported, but it's used by abusive parents um, and their attorneys as a legal tactic to diminish claims of abuse and to get the courts to um, disbelieve or not take seriously a person alleging abuse. And it's effective even in many cases when people have a lot of evidence, you know, they have um, hospital records or arrests and convictions for domestic violence, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, this cross claim is very effective in kind of um, diminishing the importance of uh, abuse claims. And as a result, children are getting ordered to abusive parties too frequently. That's very sad to hear. Um, going forward with this information, how can we as students and as young people in our communities and especially in states or countries that don't have these laws against them. How can we make the most beneficial decisions and changes for helping women when approaching family violence? And how can we respectfully talk to our lawmakers into helping make these changes as young ones? <laughs> That's a great question. And, um, you know, we, we're seeing, um, a moment where a lot of uh, youth uh, and young adults are getting really engaged in this issue because so many of them have been personally impacted or they have friends who've been impacted, um, who've been you know, ordered to an abusive parent against their wishes. And uh, it's been a very traumatizing experience. Um, they've been court ordered to do it. And so we're seeing this current generation um, of kids and young adults uh, really taking direct action, speaking to their lawmakers, um, making videos and being on social media, talking about these issues um, and, ask, you know, just demanding change. And so if you're interested in getting involved, you can go to um, this kind of grassroots umbrella organization that we've created. Um, it's called National Safe Parents Organization. Um, and there is a youth section there and you can um, join the community and learn about more about what we're doing. We hold monthly um, live advocacy sessions. There's going to be one tonight um, and we're going to be talking about bringing class actions, uh, lawsuits against bad actors in the family court system. Um, there's an important class action suit happening in Colorado and there may be another one coming soon um, that addresses reunification camps which um, people are often kind of shocked that this thing even exists in the US, um, but it is in essence um, uh, what they're calling a treatment program whereby courts um, order uh, children who you know, say that they've been abused or who are afraid or resisting contact with one of their parents. The courts are ordering these kids to go to these reunification camps to reunify with the parent that they're resistant to being with. Um, they're very expensive and they're unregulated. And um, many times they're out of state. And so um, the protective parent, the safe parent um, is usually forced also to pay for this. And what happens in these reunification camps or, or treatments, quote unquote, um, are that the abused child or the child who's afraid of this parent has to spend time with the, the parent they're afraid of um, and play games with them and do kind of all kinds of exercises. Um, in many cases, they're not allowed to talk about the abuse or what they're afraid of. Um, and they're not allowed to uh, resist. They're usually threatened um, that if they don't cooperate, they will they will lose contact with their safe parent, the parent they're bonded with and they want to be with. Um, sometimes they're threatened that they'll be put in foster care if they don't cooperate. Sometimes they're threatened that um, their, their protective parent, who's usually their mom, will go to jail. And sometimes these women are put in jail for um, interfering for not participating in these reunification programs. So um, a lot of kids who have been sent into these um, treatments are speaking out now. Um, you can see that on National Safe Parents Organization under the youth section, you can see some videos um, of, of young people who've been impacted. There's currently a case in Utah um, 
uh, of two kids. Their names are Ty and Brinley. They're, they're siblings. And um, they have been, the older boy, Ty, has been streaming on TikTok and various channels. Um, I think his handle is Stupid Flipper, um, because he and his younger sister have been court ordered to, to, to into the custody of their abusive father. And they have barricaded themselves in their, in their room um, uh, because they don't want the police to come and take them and force them back to their abuser. And um, the, the father was confirmed to be an abuser. The child welfare system found that he uh, sexually and emotionally and physically abused them in 2018. But the, the custody courts nevertheless ordered this um, custody to the father. So there's lots of ways you can sort of get engaged and learn about what's happening. Um, obviously, you can speak to your state lawmakers, you know, and talk to them about what is happening and why we need reforms and why we need to bring cadence law to your state. Your state can get money um, if you become eligible and adopt those provisions in the new federal law. Um, and you can support, you know, and just talk to your to your friends um, and raise awareness uh, among them about what's happening in family court and why we need reform so that kids are better protected. Thank you so much, Danielle, for talking with me today. And thank you, Remy, for kind of organizing this whole thing. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today to be a part of this conversation. I hope that everyone learned things and was able to just try and have this information as we move on into our communities, into helping people that are going through this. If you enjoyed it, let us know by sharing it with other people and just making sure people know about this and follow RFK Human Rights on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. So you can be one of the first people to learn about our next event. I hope that everyone here enjoyed it and is excited about the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. And thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it.